Good evening and welcome to a special episode of Anan Podcast where we're shooting live from El Bujeri during the Miss Global Forum 2023. With me in this this evening is Dr. Michio Kako, theorist, a theoretical physicist and futurologist. Uh, who's also the professor of theoretical science in City College of New York. Welcome, Dr. Michio. Glad to be on the show. I'm very glad to have you. So I think your subject matter expertise is incredibly intriguing in that I personally don't know much about it. So I'd like to know from you, um, when did your interest in theoretical physics start and how did it start? Well, when I was eight years old, oh, wow. something happened which changed my life completely. All the newspapers said that a great scientist had just died, but that he could not finish his greatest work. And he left the unfinished manuscript on his desk when he died. So everyone was wondering, what's in that book that he <laughs> couldn't finish? And so later I went to the library to find out who was this person that, that has passed away. And I found out that his name was Albert Einstein. And that book was the unfinished theory of everything. He wanted an equation perhaps no more than one inch long that would allow him to, quote, read the mind of God. Oh, God. <laughs> so I said to myself, that's for me. Anyway, later on, I became one of the uh, creators of something called string theory. We think string theory could be the missing link. It says that all the subatomic particles, the neutrons, the protons, all of the hundreds of subatomic particles are nothing but little vibrations on a string, like a little loop, like a rubber band. So an electron would look like this, a proton would look like this, just different vibrations on one string. And so what is physics? Physics is the melodies you can play on this thing. What is chemistry? Chemistry is the harmonies you can play on these vibrating strings. What is the universe? The universe is a symphony of these vibrating strings. I think the last time I saw a documentary on string th theory may have been around 12 years ago, if I'm not mistaken. Is it parallel universes as well? That's right. Some people don't like the theory because it gives you a multiverse of universes. Hollywood loves that, of course. All the Marvel Spider -Man. comics. <laughs> yes, Spider-Man. They all live in the multiverse. You have anti-Spider-Man and co-Spider-Man, so on and so forth. It comes from physics. And string theory does say that there could be other parallel universes. You can't visit them, of course. But there could be other universes in a multiverse of universes. That's incredible. And how does one begin in this field? So we, we, we heard about, you know, Dr. Michio at eight years old being curious as to what is that document that Einstein left on his desk? How do you go from that kid to being one of the creators of string theory? Well, first it helps to have an education. So I got into Harvard because I did a science fair project in high school. I built an atom smasher, a particle accelerator when I was in high school. I assembled um, 500 pounds of transformer steel, 22 miles of copper wire, and I assembled a six kilowatt atom smasher in my mom's garage. <laughs> Every time I plugged it in, I would blow out all the circuit breakers in the house. <laughs> and my poor mom, she would say, how come I don't have a son who plays baseball? You would have made her life much easier. <laughs> and why can't you find a nice Japanese girlfriend? What's wrong with my son that he wants to build these machines in the garage? So a lot of physicists are like that. They like to put things together as kids. They like to play with things like particle accelerators when they're kids. It shows up very early in their life. And the kids that are playing baseball have no idea what those things even mean, probably. <laughs> That's right, but we physicists know. <laughs> Amazing. So given you know everything that you know and your work in this space, what do you think are the future trends in physics advancement? Well. I wrote, recently wrote a book called Quantum Supremacy about quantum computers. In other words, there's something called quantum mechanics, which is the theory of atoms. And uh, we think that in the future, transistors, which power the laptop that you have, uh, are going to be replaced, replaced by atoms. And that's the tiniest object you can get. And so quantum computers could eventually replace ordinary computers. And so that's the subject of my latest book. It's a New York Times bestseller called Quantum Supremacy, about the time when uh, computers have transistors the size of atoms, which is the ultimate computer. 
That's incredible. And how do you think, um, what role do you think youth have in this space or in this field? I think youth uh, is, determines everything within this field. This is a theory for young people. Look at all the young people who started the computer revolution. They were teenagers. Right. Every single one was a teenager. They founded Apple Computer, they founded Microsoft Computers. Um, and so it's, it's a young person's game that people play with these things as toys, then they graduate toward prototypes of computers, then they start to build laptops, they start to build right. um, different kinds of computers, and they become billionaires. Right. That's uh, curiosity kicking in and allowing them to play in the space until they hit home. Right. That's and incredible. some people say, why can't you simply become a businessman and then learn how to market computers? Well, yeah, but think of all the billionaires who actually did become rich. Right. They were engineers first. First, they learned the math. They learned how to program computers. Then they began to learn accounting once they started to make millions of dollars. And so first they learned the mathematics and the science. The innovation the, part. The innovation part. And then later they learned the bookkeeping part. How do you think we transition f to quantum mechanics from an age where, you know, we see a rise in uh, utilization of AI in the day to day of people? Um, how do we go from that, which I think is not at the stage where it's reached its ultimate capacity, but is on the way. Um, how do you think we transition from that to quantum mechanics and atoms replacing? Uh well, the computers of the future require two things. One, they require software, so you can talk to it, you can engage it, you can play with it. That's software. But you have to have hardware, too. You have to have the ability to have enough power to do these things, enough memory to do these things. And so the software is artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is basically lines of code that allow you to do a lot of things, like recognize labels on a, on a jar, uh, sell products, and things like that. But the hardware that is the guts of the computer is uh, how many transistors you have, or here, how many atoms you have. And that is a question of quantum computers. So they go hand in hand with software driving the um, the intelligence of a, a, an intelligent system and quantum computers driving the hardware of the system. You need both. What happens when AI um, develops to a point where it's, or will it become, uh, develop to a point where it's consciously running the, the, the hardware on its own? I think we have a long ways to go before robots suddenly pick up and want to take over. Nice. Uh, take a look at the animal kingdom. If you take a cockroach and put it in the forest, it immediately finds mates, shelter, food, runs around the forest. If you take a military robot and put it in the forest, what, do you, what happens to it? It falls over. Right. It can't even stand up right. in the middle of a forest. And so eventually, however, it's inevitable that robots will become as smart as a mouse then later as smart as a rat, then as smart as a dog or a cat, and maybe a hundred years from now when they come as smart as a chimpanzee, that's when you start to worry. <laughs> because chimpanzees have a mind of their own. Mm. They don't have to listen to you. Now dogs, dogs are confused. <laughs> dogs think that we are a dog. They're distracted. <laughs> yeah, they think that we're a dog, that's why they obey us, that's why we play with them, and they, they follow us. Because we're the top dog, they're the underdog. Chain of command. Yeah, that's right. But once, once robots become as smart as a chimpanzee, I think we should put a chip in their brain to shut them off if they have murderous thoughts. <laughs> so you think it'll be some time before AI reaches to a development stage where humans become dispensable? Yeah, I think that's way in the future because right now uh, computers and robots are adding machines. We mm -hmm. forget that. They're basically adding machines. You can't talk to them. You can't converse with them. You can't have an intelligent dialogue with them. You give them orders. They understand the orders and they carry it out. But try, try to have a nice conversation with one. Right. <laughs> and you'll find out that you don't get very far with that. Absolutely. So the robots are not conscious. They're sophisticated adding machines, very sophisticated adding machines that have the semblance of being intelligent, but they're not really. In other words, 
The uh, chatbots that people have talked about, the chatbots, they're tape recorders. Tape recorders, they basically regurgitate what's on the internet, mm -hmm. splices them together, cuts them up, splices them together, and passes it off as an essay. Right. It's not like they're intelligent because they wrote that essay. No, it's already on the web. It's on the internet. They cut it up and splice them together so it sounds as if they're creating something original when they're not. Absolutely. So do you think um, in, the, in the near trajectory of uh, AI development, there will be setbacks when people realize that the utilization of it is not all it's cut out to be right now? Uh, yeah, right now some people may be a little bit afraid of it, but when they actually use it, they realize, hey, this is useful. You could write letters, you could do all it's sorts of research. Uh, these are actually useful devices. Uh, scientists created them not just to show off. Uh, scientists created <laughs> them to do something, to sell products, for example. Uh, and as a consequence, people are going to eventually figure out, hey, this is useful. I could use this to make money. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I for one, am always a little bit cautious about <laughs> technology. Um, I don't know why, but I always am. And I find it an incredibly useful tool, to be honest. But it's a matter of how you utilize it. Uh, and we had an extensive debate about that today. Um, let's go back to physics a little bit mm -hmm. um, and break that down. What does physics mean in the day-to-day -day life, in our day-to-day -day life? Well, if you think about it, everything that happens around you is physics. Uh, electricity, uh, that you turn on the light, uh, you wash your dishes. Um, everything that's electric comes from uh, electricity, which in turn is physics. Mm -hmm. If you turn on the TV as physics, and you talk about the space program, and we have satellites and people that want to go to the moon, all of that is physics. The rockets, the propellant, the navigation, all of that is physics. And then uh, late at night, uh, when you want to play games, all those games come out of the internet based on transistors, which are physics. Right. In other words, you are surrounded by physics. You just you don't, don't necessarily know that. That's right, you don't know that. In other words, people say, what has physics done for me lately? <laughs> and the answer is everything. What has it not done for you? <laughs> everything comes from physics. Your appliances, the electricity, the lights, medicines, Everything had to eventually come from physics. Tell us a little bit about theoretical physics and how, and how or if it can be leveraged to hack life. By hacking life, you mean to create artificial life or what do you mean by hacking life? Potentially, or like figure out you know, how we can best use it to our advantage in um, our, our daily existence. You mean to take over somebody else's to, uh, to, mind? To <laughs> mind? Telekinesis, <control? laughs> why not? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's science fiction because uh, we don't even know how to control your own mind, right, let that's alone true. someone else's <laughs> mind. <laughs> so yeah. that's science fiction. So in other words, a lot of stuff that we think we know about robots is science fiction. Mm -hmm. We've seen too many Ar Arnold Schwarzenegger movies, <laughs> <laughs> and we think we know it but it's all science fiction. Robots are adding machines. They're very sophisticated adding machines. They think, we think they're conscious in fact, but no, they simply regurgitate what's already on the internet, just repackage it, and uh, they have the intelligence when they move around of a cockroach. They can barely, they can barely walk around. That's very interesting insights. Um, I wanted to ask you, if you could go back in time to 20 year old you, so that's two years into Harvard, I assume. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what advice would you give to yourself then? Having known everything that you know now, other than cheating off of string theory, don't, you know, you can't give. <laughs> well, gee, I never really thought about that before because I thought that um, the advice I gave myself when I was then, you know, uh, do your homework, be conscientious, uh, try to learn things, um, uh, did, did, did pretty good, I think. So I think that if I were to do it again, I would do it again. Oh, that's incredible. That's incredible and absolutely powerful because I think, you know, you go back whenever, you know, I, I go back in time sometimes. I'm like, if only I had 
done this. I wish I could have told myself this one thing. But I love that you um, come full circle and you can still say that I gave myself the best advice I possibly could at that given moment. Who were your inspirations? Well, um, my parents were not good role models in the sense that they were not professors, they were not scientists. Uh, father was a, was a gardener, mm -hmm. mother was a maid. And so I realized that if I had to do something good, I had to do it myself. I no one's going to help me do it. But, but to go back to that point, uh, father was a gardener, mother was a maid. How were their work ethics? Well, they wanted to provide for their children. They sacrificed. So you kind of feel guilty goofing off because they're your parents uh, sweating and doing everything to put food on the table. And there you are goofing off. So I decided not to goof off. Amazing. And I assume that their commitment and dedication to what they do and to their mission to providing um, and putting food on the table for you guys um, uh, may have inspired your own commitment and dedication. Yeah, and also the fact that my parents suffered hardship. You know, during World War II, they were locked up mm. and they were put in camps in California. Wow. And all their money was confiscated by the U.S. government and they were put behind barbed wire and machine guns, in fact, uh, for four years. So at that point, you begin to realize that life is a gift. Mm -hmm. You can't take it for granted that you should um, be grateful for what you have. And then from that, make something of yourself. That's incredible. Thank you so much for that. Um, any final words that you would like to leave uh, youth with before we close our session? I would tell youth that you can be whatever you want to be, but you have to have the imagination, you have to have the drive, you have to have the initiative. And as far as jobs are concerned, almost all the jobs originate from science. Of course, you can become billionaires when you invest in science, play the stock market and stuff like that. But if you look at all the billionaires, uh, you know, name all the billionaires that, you, that you, they're familiar with from the newspaper, they all came from a science background and then learned how to do accounting, learn how to keep track of the stock market, learn how to uh, do stocks and things like that. And so the world is not becoming less technical, it's becoming more technical. Absolutely. So I tell young people, learn the technology because it's fun, because it's empowerment, because it increases your power, being able to do all these different things with computers. So think of it as fun rather than drudgery, and I think you'll go far. Incredible, thank you so much for that. And it has been an absolute honor um, having this conversation with you. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you very much. Thank yes. you.